before any actions had been taken. The first challenge was therefore to make sure that Rydia had been used enough throughout the rest of the game to be able to survive the fight and be useful enough that the party could win. The second challenge was that just beating Bahamut wasn't enough to convince it to return to Rydia. Prior to the fight, Leviathan and Asura would also need to be defeated in optional fights with Rydia also present in the party. Without knowing these requirements, the acquisition of Bahamut would rely on a significant portion of luck outside of the actual challenge of coming through all of these encounters intact, and that's why Bahamut from the After Years deserves a spot on this list. Final Fantasy VIII featured a whole host of summons, some of which, like Doom Train, were not all that easy to acquire due to the amount of item grinding required, but for this list we're going to include the optional summons that were associated with Chocobo's World, the Pocket Station spin-off game that was connected with Final Fantasy VIII for its release in Japan. Back then, players could find specific items in Chocobo's World that would allow them to summon Boko, Minimo, and Moomba. Each had unique elements to their summons, and Boko could even become so powerful that its final move, Chocobokal, would break the damage limit and deal up to 60,000 damage as opposed to the standard 9,999. Most Western gamers never had the chance to experience such delights, that was, until the release of Final Fantasy VIII Remastered, as the items required to summon Boko, Minimog, and Moomba were integrated into the game via Angelo Search. But even though they were now possible to find, due to the ridiculously low drop rates, the items seldom crop up, and you could be searching for hours upon hours before finding any of the required items. Not necessarily hard in the sense of being challenging mechanically, but they are definitely hard to acquire based on the joys of random number generation. Throughout a playthrough of the original oh, Final yeah, Fantasy VII, awesome. summon material could be acquired in numerous ways. From being picked up on the floor or gifted as a reward, it kept things interesting for players, as sometimes the locations that they could be found would be less than desirable. But one summon material took the biscuit in terms of difficulty to obtain, and that was the famed Knights of the Round. In the basic sense, Knights of the Round could be picked up from the aptly named Round Island, a hidden island in the northwest area of the world map. But the challenge was that this could only be accessed by someone riding a gold chocobo, and to obtain a gold chocobo, the player would need to become quite intimate with the chocobo breeding minigame that was connected with chocobo racing. To obtain a gold chocobo, you would need to breed a black chocobo with a wonderful yellow chocobo, and you need to use a zero nut. To ensure a 100% chance of the breeding being a success, each of the parents would also need to have taken part in 12 chocobo races between them. That all sounds simple enough, but it negates the requirements of obtaining a black chocobo and a blue or green chocobo before that, which could also be time consuming because their parents would have also needed to be bred with a certain type using a certain type of nut and would have also been required to complete a certain number of races to ensure breeding success. In short, breeding a gold chocobo could be a time consuming affair, but Knights of the Round was worth it due to the sheer damage output, especially when matched up to create some devilish material combos. for over 60 years, so I should be getting it right by now. However, is that what I'm trying to do? Am I trying to get it right, or am I trying to find something? This is not an ordinary master class. I really don't like to tell people things, so I hope you won't expect me to do that. But during our time together, we're gonna talk about what creates magical moments. That magic is something living. And to me, that's the essence of what I try to do in music, transmitting something so it lives in somebody else. At one point, I had the audacity to think I could play a perfect concert. A 
was in the middle of a concert and I realized everything was going perfectly well and I was bored out of my mind. That was the moment that I made a fateful decision that I was actually going to devote my life to human expression versus human perfection. Music connects people. You're sharing something with others. You're almost like the scientist for the inner soul. The whole act of life is a balance of unbelievably intricate forces of which music is a subset. I'm Yo-Yo Ma, and this is Masterclass. the random number generation summons from Final Fantasy VIII Remastered, we'd be remiss to include the summons from Final Fantasy IV that also required a significant portion of luck to obtain. Even though most summons could be obtained through either natural progression or by beating them in optional boss battles, the developers decided to include four summons that could only be found as dropped from random encounters and they would allow the player to call forth some of the standard enemies from the bestiary. Those four were Bomb, Cockatrice, Goblin and the Mind Flayer. To detail just how rare each of these summons were to find, we need to delve into the game's inner workings. Each enemy encountered in the game had a 5% chance of dropping something, and each of the items required to obtain the summons we're talking about were classified as very rare, which had a 0.4% drop rate. Combined, those are some very small odds, and there are reports of people spending well over 8 hours attempting to obtain just one of these summons. In the Pixel Remaster, the developers have decided to be a bit more generous and have increased the drop rate from 0.4 to 2%, but it's still pretty low, and unless you're a completionist, these summons are probably not worth the effort based on what they actually offer in combat. Final Fantasy XII featured an array of espers that had strong connections to Evers, as opposed to the traditional roster, and each of them would need to be defeated before you could be able to call upon their strength in battle. Some of these fights would be part of natural story progression, but some of the more powerful espers resided deep in the bowels of the land as optional battles, and one of the most annoying was Zodiac. We covered Zodiac in our video about some of the cheapest bosses to appear in the Final Fantasy franchise, and it kicked off the list for a good reason, because unless you were fully prepared for what was about to come, the fight would be over almost as soon as it started. And that's because, upon entering the arena, Zodiac would cast a Dark Jar, a move that had the chance to inflict instant KO on every character, as well as the annoying blind status. It would also use a ton of enhancing spells such as Reflect and Haste, as well as moves that would often kill characters that did not have the HP limit broken. To make matters worse, as the fight progressed, Zodiac would become progressively stronger, to the point that at its last hurrah, it would use Dark Jar with increased frequency, increase its attack power, and become immune to physical attacks. In short, defeating Zodiac was tough, but the reward was more than worth it, as when called upon, Zodiac would deal considerable damage, and its ultimate attack, Final Eclipse, would deal approximately 50,000 damage depending on the version of the game you're playing and the enemy you are facing. And that brings us on to our last summon, which is quite unorthodox, Omega. Omega was first introduced in Final Fantasy V as one of the two super bosses, and it has since appeared in numerous games as a challenging foe. But in Dissidia, Omega appeared as a potential ally as it was one of the many, many summons that could be obtained that the player could call upon for assistance. Many of the summons could be found as reward for completing certain stages in the story, such as Ifrit being associated with Destiny Odyssey 1-3, and Omega was no different, as it was associated with Inward Chaos 2. But what made Omega so taxing to acquire was that to even get to Inward Chaos 2 required a significant amount of effort and skill. In the original Japanese version, this storyline would be unlocked after defeating Chaos, but in subsequent releases of Dissidia across North America, Europe, and even Japan as universal tuning, it was changed to only be unlocked once every other storyline had been completed. 
It was also then the hardest storyline in the game, with each of the foes faced close to and sometimes exceeding level 100. In the case of Inward Chaos 2, to acquire Omega, players would either need to defeat a level 97 Terror and level 99 Squall, or defeat a level 96 Bart and level 98 Cloud. But if they were successful, they would gain access to one of the strongest summons in the game, as when called upon, for every second that passed for a maximum of 13 seconds, Omega would continue to harm your opponent's bravery. And with that, I think we're done. They were seven of the hardest summons to obtain across the entire Final Fantasy franchise. Let us know in the comments below which summon you felt was hardest to obtain, and of course, if you enjoyed the video, please be sure to hit that like button and subscribe to our channel. Alright guys, this is Daryl signing out. I'd like to thank all of our Patreon and YouTube membership supporters. Greetings YouTube, Simon here and welcome to another Final Fantasy. H Remaster video guide. Today I'm going to be showing you how you can get your very own Lionheart weapon, the most powerful weapon for Squall, on disc 1. So it's a very nice weapon to have, especially early on. It does a ton of damage, gives access to the amazing Lionheart limit rate, and you're just going to have a whole lot of fun causing wreckage to every foe you meet. Now, a couple of points to note. First of all, if you haven't checked out my previous video guide showing you how you can overpower your party members early on, I recommend you do that. I'll leave a link in the description to it. Uh, mainly because you'll uh, follow that and then actually possibly gain access to some of the items already automatically that you're going to need today. Uh, but also I strongly advise that you keep your party members at a low level. I always recommend that for Final Fantasy VIII because of how the in-game mechanics work. But also, more importantly for today, if you hit level 20, one of the items you need to farm will no longer be available until much later on in the game, well after disc 1. So keep your levels low. One way you can do that is by using the important card ability. Just make sure you have it equipped on one of your party members. And instead of killing enemies normally, finish them off with the card ability. That will actually prevent them from giving your party any experience. But you will still collect all the other rewards that that enemy would otherwise give you, including AP for your Guardian Forces. So it's a great way to farm enemies without actually levelling up. Right, as always guys, a huge thank you to all those who support me on YouTube as a member or on Patreon as a Patron. Uh, and especially big thanks to Sean who is the latest Patron to sign up to the channel. So thank you so much for your support there guys. And if you enjoy the video, don't forget to leave a like and uh, stay subscribed to the channel. I have plans for so much Final Fantasy. <sighs> Не, я что-то забываю, забыл, не это. Несколько часов уже здесь, да, да, да. Слушай, ты чинить. Ну, сижу уже, что ты я тут сижу-то?
знания, знаешь, поразнишься или ты что? Все, 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 все знаешь, да? Все понятно. Версия такая, что должно быть то, что тебя стимулирует, завораживает. То есть э, в компьютерных играх ты всегда будешь как бы девчонкой, скажем так. Да. Ну, я не знаю про вас, как бы. Может, у вас исключение. Ну да, да. Вот это есть на Задумали все, Москвой сделал, вот это есть на Москву. Как это делать по мужски я должен представлять? Ну, не, не понял. Тебя тут все не понял. Так может я тоже такой же, как девчонка. Учить надо себя чего-нибудь делать. Это хорошо. Хорошие вещи. Много всего там было, да, много всего. Или наоборот. Наоборот, это не Ну не то, не то. Ладно, все тогда, все тогда, ладно, да. Наоборот, не знаю, да. Не знаю, да. Наоборот, не знаю. 